Well, good evening, everyone. Members of the LSE student body, members of our teaching staff, members of the public, it's great to see you here. My name is Craig Calhoun, and as Jonathan suggested, I'm the director of the LSE. And I'm particularly happy to be here tonight because I think LSE 100 is a wonderful course that really does bring out important features of just what the LSE stands for. And happily, we have a speaker whom I think demonstrates some of this and the importance of what we're doing. The prize-giving event is an annual event that honors a particularly distinguished set of student achievements, but really the students as a whole are quite remarkable. And this course, which is compulsory for all undergraduates, enriches the education of each. Since its founding, the LSE has been devoted to knowledge that matters for practical action, to understanding the major social issues of our era, and to grasping the course of social change. None of the big questions that affect our societies can be answered entirely by a narrow focus on any one discipline. Seeing problems from simply one angle is a recipe for misunderstanding them. We need to be able to range across the disciplines of the social sciences, to make the best use of different approaches, different research methodologies, different analytic perspectives, in order to understand how different kinds of knowledge relate to each other and to the phenomena we, reserve, we observe in the world around us. This is the only way to tackle issues like economic growth and development, inequality, migration, the shifting financial relations between East and West, the globalization of cultural production and circulation, war, human rights, or the strengths and weaknesses of democratic governments. None of these is contained within a single discipline alone. LSC 100 discusses big issues like these, but its most basic point is to cultivate the capacity to judge the quality of different kinds of arguments, the evidence on which they are based, and the claims they make to grasp the causes of things. That is why it is required and why some of the world-class academics at the LSE are eager to take part. Happily, they even let me take part, and I enjoy being among the lecturers in LSE 100. I want to add my personal congratulations to the students who have received prizes this evening and who waited patiently for their prizes when we attempted to deny them. <laughs> and also to all of those who successfully completed the course, I want to thank Sir Robert Worcester for his support for LSE 100 from the beginning and the continuing support he shows for this as for other LSE activities. It is appropriate that the Sir Robert Worcester Prizes will continue to recognize his contributions for years to come, not just because he has been such a supporter, but because he too exemplifies this ability to see key problems from different analytic angles, maintaining rigor while gaining breadth. I turn now to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Jillian Tett. Jillian is herself an important intellectual and a an person who exemplifies this ability to see problems that are immediate in the world, that are part of current events, to see them in the light of serious academic and intellectual scholarship, but also as a journalist to investigate their different dimensions in the world today. She is an immensely appropriate choice for this event. Jillian combines a doctorate in social anthropology from Cambridge with a position as one of the world's leading experts on financial markets. She once told The Guardian that anthropology is a brilliant background for looking at finance, and I think that she has proved that this is true. She predicted the 2008 financial crisis two years before it happened, then dissected it in her 2009 book, Fool's Gold, which won the inaugural Spears Business Book of the Year Award. Having been named Journalist of the Year at the 2009 British Press Awards, she moved to the US as managing editor of the Financial Times, where I first met her. Happily, she then moved this past summer back to the UK in order to write another book, something for all of us to look forward to in 2013. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Jillian to the LSE, and to introduce her lecture entitled, Dazed and Confused, Making Sense of an Uncertain Economy.
Well, thank you very much indeed for that very kind introduction. I didn't see the graphic they put on the poster for Days to Confuse until just now. And I was looking at the faces down below and I was trying to work out which of those faces looked more dazed and confused than anyone else. I think probably David Cameron wins it. <laughs> but I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today for two reasons. Firstly, as a mere journalist, it's a great honour to be here speaking in an academic context and I'd like to add my congratulations to all the students who've just won those prizes. But secondly, because the goal of silo-busting and trying to take a more holistic view of the world, which is what this course encapsulates, is very much something that I applaud and support. I've had a rather odd career myself, moving between anthropology and finance and markets and politics. Um, and I'm now, in fact, so excited by the idea of silo-busting that I'm writing a book about it. But it is indeed a very, very valuable endeavor. And it's a theme that I'm going to be picking up on my speech tonight, or very much picking up in my speech tonight, because I decided to call this lecture Dazed and Confused, not so much because I'm a Led Zeppelin fan, <laughs> although those of you who are the right age may recognize the title. I think many of you won't, but anyway. <laughs> but um, because I think it sums up very well that many, the way that many investors I speak to um, react when you ask them to make sense of what's going on in the world today. They feel dazed and confused partly because the world is indeed a rather complex place that's been through the most extraordinary period of upheaval and drama in the last five years since the financial crisis started. But I think there's a sense of being dazed and confused amongst many investors and policy makers because also Many of the key tools that people have used to try and make sense of the world until quite recently no longer appear to be working quite so well. What do I mean by that? Well, when I look back at the last two decades, it often seems to me that the world has gone through three distinct phases. Before 2007, economists sometimes used to say that the global economy, at least the Western economy, was experiencing something known as an era of great moderation. What that phrase meant, as far as economists were concerned, when they used it quite narrowly, was that around the turn of the century, it looked as if the economic profession was faced with a world where inflation, for the most part, had been tamed, and where central bankers appeared to have discovered the holy grail of keeping growth on track amid that low inflation, where, in fact, central bankers appear to be very wise, so much so that a book came out calling Alan Greenspan the maestro. And at the same time, it looked as if, although there were business cycles in the world, they appeared to be relatively predictable. There was quite high confidence that in a world when free market forces appeared to have taken reign, where man appeared and woman appeared to have become homo economicus, where for the most part it was economics, not politics, that was driving events, there was a quite strong belief that as long as you had the key economic numbers and could plug them into a spreadsheet or a complicated computer model, for the most part you could predict the future. There was great confidence in the ability of those flashy models to predict the future, to forecast out 10 years. And frankly, the things that really mattered in life were presumed to be the things that you could plug into a spreadsheet. Those were the key variables. So until 2007, there was a period of the era of great moderation in many, many senses. Then, of course, in 2008, that sunny confidence in those models and the ability to predict things, this idea that economics rocked to a fairly predictable rhythm, was blown apart very dramatically. And in the course of a few jarring, jolting months, the world woke up and realized that there was a reason why the roots of the word credit come from the Latin credere, meaning to believe. Finance is fundamentally a social construct. Finance without faith doesn't work. Credit markets without credit simply stop working. And for a while, there was a sense of chaos, confusion, and panic. Alan Greenspan came out with a memoir in 2007, which he decided to call Age of Turbulence, 
wonderfully ironic because, of course, he epitomized the era of great moderation or the sunny self-confidence before 2007. But in many ways, I look at, back at the period of 2008-2009 very much as an era which ironically lived up to Greenspan's memoir's name. It was an age of turbulence. The good news today, however, is that we don't live in quite such turbulent times right now. After the jarring panic of 2008 and 2009, most of the key metrics that investors or financial analysts or financial journalists look at when they try and take the temperature of the markets and assess the level of panic that's out there or not out there, things like the VIX, the measure of volatility, things like the cost of borrowing between banks or the cost of raising money in the markets, most of those key measures, most of those key dials on the dashboard have actually subsided. They've gone back to not quite normal, but in many ways a much calmer environment. People are talking about the new normal, this sense of quasi-stability. But of course, it's not the new normal as in a return to the era of great moderation. That sense of sunny confidence isn't there. Not just because people can see that there are fundamentally huge economic challenges dogging the world, but also because, in many ways, the idea of having faith in homo economicus alone, the idea of just believing the models, has been blown apart. We've entered an era when, suddenly, issues that economists never used to pay that much attention to, like political systems, are mattering enormously. The state, the government... All these things that to free market economists seem rather irritating irrelevances are suddenly having very profound impact on how the economy works. That's partly because the scale of the challenges dogging the economies is so huge that the government's action or inaction is inevitably very, very important. But it's also because the government is interfering in the workings of the economy in a very profound way, whether it's through bailouts, whether it's through things like financial repression, in all manner of ways, the actions of governments and politics matters enormously. But there's a terrible irony. Just as people are looking to governments for answers and looking to governments for, in terms of the impact that they're having on the economy, they're also beginning to realise that not only are governments and go- government systems often lacking, but also they're very capricious very hard to predict, very hard to model. You can't plug into a spreadsheet the key variables to do with what the governments are doing on either either side of the Atlantic today. And that's creating this sense of being very dazed and confused. Issues like political brinkmanship are coming to the fore. And in many ways, if I had to characterize the era today, the era of new normal, I'd say we're living through an era when political bargaining, political brinkmanship, politics in general, are becoming increasingly crucial. So what do I mean by political brinkmanship? Well, I was recently in Washington at a very, very interesting meeting that I was lucky enough to take part in between a group of very senior American officials, congressmen, and other key American business leaders, and some officials from the Eurozone. And it included a man who possibly has one of the worst sales jobs in the world today, a man called Ambassador de Almeida. He is the Eurozone's ambassador to Washington. And his job is to go around Washington telling American businessmen and American political leaders that what's happening today in the Eurozone makes sense. What's worse, he has to go around and persuade them not, not only does it make sense, but the Eurozone is a wonderful partner to have in the international economy, and a great place to invest. Now, luckily, he's charming. He's very, very seductive. He's Portuguese. He's worked for years with President Barroso from the Commission, and he does an extraordinarily good job. And so, at this meeting in Washington, I saw him deliver his sales patter. And essentially, the sales patter went something like this. And and he's paraphrasing not just his views, but the views of the European elite, the Eurozone elite, the Commission. But the argument goes something like this. When you Americans, and it could equally well apply to you Brits if you like, but when you Americans look at the Eurozone today, what you tend to see is a place 
that appears to be bizarrely crisis-ridden. Every few months, you pick up a paper, hopefully the Financial Times, that's my words, not his, um, and you see the word crisis in the headline. And so you Americans might be tempted to panic and think the place is a mess, but that's wrong. His words. In fact, what you need to recognize is what's going on in the Eurozone today is all part of a plat- pattern of the political economy that you need to understand. And essentially it's this. Today, the Eurozone leadership can understand perfectly well that the structural underpinnings of the Eurozone are in many ways inconsistent. I mean, many people in Britain might say they're downright mad, but inconsistent is the way they prefer to see it in Brussels. Essentially, it's very hard to have a monetary union without some form of fiscal union and banking union. And so there's a recognition that in the long term, that's kind of where you need to get to make monetary union work. The direction of travel is fairly clear. The problem, though, is that in somewhere like the Eurozone, you have 27 different countries, and due to the past with the war and history, there's no tradition of anything other than consensus to push big decision-making forward. And so essentially, in a consensus-driven world, you have two choices about how to proceed when you have very, very difficult decisions to make on a par as actually getting the foundations of the Eurozone to match up, i.e. to introduce fiscal union and banking union into a region that may not necessarily want it. You can either sit around and wait and have endless summits in Brussels that last for many, many days and are fantastically tedious and repetitive but eventually you wear everyone down and a consensus of thought emerges. I used to work as a journalist in Brussels and I saw this at first hand and it's dreadful to write about because it often appears as as if nothing is happening for a very long period of time. And yet, after hour after hour of sitting around the table, slowly a consensus starts to form. So you either wait a long time or you have some kind of external shock to force people to come to consensus quickly, to move together quickly, like a market crisis. And so, within that view of the world, if you look back in the last two or three years, essentially what you've had is a series of rolling crises every two to three months, that whenever you get a crisis, there's a sense of panic. The Financial Times writes crisis in its headlines. Everyone gets very dramatic. And then out of that crisis comes a sense of drama that helps to push the system forward a bit. And if you look back over the last three years, they would argue in Brussels, in fact, you can see that the Eurozone has really moved. Not fast, but it's moved. It's inching towards banking union. It's inching towards talking about fiscal union. It is gradually changing in terms of its foundations. So essentially... What someone like Dale Media would argue is that when you look at what's happening in the Eurozone today, don't just see it in terms of dry economics or political drama. See it within the wider political economy and how an area is slowly changing. Well, he delivered the argument in very seductive terms, and to a certain extent, the audience was convinced, until one person put their hand up and said, well, hang on a sec. This all sounds perhaps logical. You can argue that maybe the Eurozone is gradually moving towards some kind of slightly more sensible foundation, but it's also a very messy way to operate. Surely there's something better. Why does it have to be so messy and complex? At which point Dale Mida turned around and said, well, tell me how it's different from America today. Because if you look at Washington, where I've spent an awful lot of time over the last two or three years, and look at it in terms of that pattern of brinkmanship, that pattern of going to the edge of a crisis and then pulling back just before you tip over the edge, which is very much what's been happening in the Eurozone, where essentially Mario Draghi has been watching the system go to the edge of a crisis and then pull back just before it slides off the edge, while all the time maintaining pressure on the politicians to do something, all the while maintaining a sense of just enough panic to get action. If you look at that pattern and compare it back to what's been happening in Congress, in some ways it's not all that different. Many of you will have read about the endless discussions that have been happening 
in terms of the so-called fiscal cliff or in terms of the endless debates about the debt burden and how to deal with that. And for much of the last two years, Congress has been essentially gridlocked in terms of trying to take any action on how to deal with the debt problem. And not just debt locked, gridlocked in terms of trying to draw up a big plan to deal with the debt, it's actually experienced a so-called government shutdown because it couldn't even get enough agreement on how to create an annual budget. There's been this extraordinary dance of crisis, mini-crisis, going to the brink, pulling back. And we're locked in it once again right now because after the election, talks have opened up. They're going on, in fact, today in Washington about how to create some kind of agreement on what to do about the um, debt crisis, what to do about drawing up some kind of rational fiscal plan. And once again, both sides are posturing angrily. Once again, it looks as if Congress could very well go to the edge of the fiscal cliff. They may even go off it temporarily in a process I like to call bungee jumping before <laughs> coming back up again, you know, br brink, brink, of the, uh, brink of time, coming back up again just when everyone's had a panic and trying to push the system forward. As in, U as in the Eurozone, it's a very messy system to watch, a very frustrating system to watch. The dynamics in some way are a bit different in terms of what's driving it because whereas the Eurozone, the problem is fundamentally the issue of consensus, in the American context, it's much more to do with the problems of competition and checks and balances and the fact you have built-in checks and balances on every level. But the net result of creating a climate of political brinkmanship, an era of political brinkmanship, an era when the politics matter enormously but are fantastically difficult to predict, that net result on both sides of the Atlantic is actually very similar. Now, it's interesting to speculate why this era of political brinkmanship has taken hold. Why is it that political systems on both sides of the Atlantic seem so very, very dysfunctional right now? And frankly, I would imagine that you could have an entire course all of its own as part of your LSE 100 debating that issue. And I'm sure that many of you in the audience have got plenty of ideas of your own. Um, personally speaking, there are two key words I like to think about quite a lot when I try and make sense of what's happening in the political sphere today and how it's interacting with economics. One of them is the word credit in the sense of the Latin meaning trust. It's an issue which economists never used to look at very much. Um, it was the kind of thing that touchy-feely hippie anthropologists spend a lot of time looking at, but they didn't usually talk, up to, talk to serious grown-up economists too much about it. But the question of trust, I think, is very important. The other one is the issue of cohesion, another C word, which, again, is a type of concept that sociologists and anthropologists have spent a lot of time thinking about, but it hasn't been combined with economic analysis so much until now either. To take them each in turn, um, credit. Trust is something which I became fascinated in personally because when I first crashed into the world of high finance, um, when I, became, I was appointed as capital markets editor for the Financial Times back in 2005, one of the things that struck me very forcibly back then was that an awful lot of the financial system before 2007 appeared to be flying on blind faith. Flying on blind faith in the sense that a very radical transformation had taken place in finance in the banking world in the era before 2000 or the decade before 2005. Essentially what had happened was the system had changed from one where loans were originated and kept on banks' books to one where loans were originated and then distributed. So the inner core of finance had changed very radically. But the only thing that was more remarkable than the degree of change was that almost nobody appeared to be able to explain to me in totality what that actually meant in terms of where the risks were going, who was assuming the risks, how you measured credit, or even how the whole system actually operated. When I went around the world of finance in 2005, people could explain to me how the little patch in front of their own nose operated. But looking at the system as a whole was very, very hard. 
I used to beg people to provide me with a sketch map of how the whole thing hung together, and it was extremely difficult. Now, behavioral finance would suggest that if people don't understand how something works in finance, they should run away from it, or at least demand a higher price to, if they're going to invest in it. Um, in reality, what happened was that although people didn't really understand how the system worked, before 2007, you had a whole horde of investors, an entire generation, rushing, lemming-like, into this stuff they didn't really understand. In retrospect, I often think it was because you'd created a kind of cultural situation in finance which was a bit akin to the medieval Catholic Church in that you had the congregation sitting dumbly in the aisles. They were the investors, the people who consumed financial products. You had the banks, bankers who were a bit like the financial priests speaking financial Latin with complex jargon that almost no one else understood but everyone else was quite respectful of and a bit embarrassed to admit they didn't understand. And you had the financial priests, you know, waving their incense over the crowd, the congregation, all those cheap mortgages and credit cards, and the congregation was feeling quite grateful. And the whole thing had been sort of blessed by the high pope, a.k.a. Alan Greenspan, <laughs> who told everyone that innovation was good. And so the congregation was kind of sitting there rather blindly, um, trusting, having faith, and feeling a bit too embarrassed to admit they didn't quite speak financial Latin. In, a, in any case, they were enjoying the incense and the cheap credit cards. <laughs> there was a very high level of faith in the system. That was the era of great moderation. But what really started to happen after 2007 was that with the onset of the financial crisis, bits of that, fa of that cult of faith, those pillars of faith, began to crack one by one. One of the first pillars to go was faith in the power of models, faith in the rating agencies and all their clever financial science. Then faith in the banks started to crack as it became clear that if the banks had valued everything using those models and the models couldn't be trusted, then you kind of couldn't trust the value of the banks anymore. Then faith in the regulators cracked and faith in the wisdom of Alan Greenspan and all the other high popes of finance cracked. And then, in the autumn of 2008, for a period, you had faith in almost all aspects of modern finance crack. You had credit markets without credit in the purest sense. Now, what happened after that was that in 2009 and 2010, essentially the Western government stepped in and came in to replace those previous pillars of faith with the state as a new pillar of faith. And the story of what happened in 2009, and to a certain extent the reason why markets have since stabilized and become calm, was that the government became the new form of backstop for faith. Did it, did it all, in all kinds of ways. Those of you who've been doing financial history courses can certainly look back and see it. But the government provided guarantees on multiple fronts sometimes directly bailing out the system, sometimes doing it in covert ways, but essentially the government became the backstop. What's happened in the last year, if you like, is that in some ways we've moved into a new phase of this credit issue. We've moved into a world that is almost like a logical conclusion from where we've come from, in that having seen faith in banks collapse, faith in the financial science collapse, having seen faith in financial regulators crack, we're now moving to a phase where faith in government itself has started to crack. It's most clear in the Eurozone, where you can see in the financial crisis all manner of aspects where this has played out. But it can, it's also reflected in many of the surveys right across the Western world in terms of population's attitude towards government. One of my favorite surveys is one collected each year by the Edelman Group, a New York-based group which goes into 18 different countries and asks people what they trust or don't trust. And this one shows, and I apologize for not having this data with me today, but you can find it very easily if you Google it. Um, this shows very clearly that post-2007, you've had this ro rolling erosion of faith. Faith in banks cr um, cracked first, followed by faith in companies in general, then faith in government. And most recently, you've had 
in the last year, faith in public sector officials, faith in the state, fall in 17 out of the 18 countries that Edelman surveys. I don't know how many of you can guess which one did not see faith in government fall last year. It wasn't the UK. And it wasn't China either, actually. Not Germany either, no. It was, it was actually Ireland. <laughs> All of you who are Irish might be sitting there going, you what? <laughs> um, there's two theories about that. One is that actually things had got so bad in Ireland, they could only get better. <laughs> the other theory, which is actually slightly more serious, and I'm going to come on to in a minute, which is that Ireland may have a much higher level of social cohesion than many of the other countries which are surveyed. And that's personally my, my favourite theory. But Anyway, so faith in government has been cracking very dramatically. One area, in fact the only area, or the only part of society where faith has not been declining, according to this Edelman survey, is actually in the area of technology. I should say, by the way, the media doesn't do so much better either. But technology is one sector where faith has remained high all the way through and has been completely undented by the 2007 crisis. People still trust their Blackberries, or as my daughter would say, trust their iPhones. And something else very interesting is happening as well in the data, which is that if you look at who people say they trust as a source of information, where they get guidance and leadership from, before 2007, people used to look up to CEOs, political leaders, company chairmen, academics, um, university chancellors, people like that. These days, financial experts, or experts in general, are coming down. Instead, people are increasingly saying that they trust a group known as someone like me, your peer group. And if you combine that with the high trust in technology, essentially what you're seeing is a world where people are increasingly moving to trusting their Facebook friends rather than their politicians. You're looking to your social network rather than those faces up there. And that changes the authority of leaders. It means that the political climate is apt to become a lot more volatile. I think part of the reason why we had this new world of celebrity politics, this rather skittish mood in politics, the sense of things flicking back and forth, the short-termism, it partly reflects a sh broader shift in the cultural patterns of communication. It partly reflects fundamental problems like electoral cycles. But it also reflects the way that authority is playing out and that trust is playing out in a manner, manner that, frankly, I think we're only beginning to really analyse and actually understand. I mean, things like Facebook and Twitter are very, very new inventions and developments in terms of the political economy. And it's something which needs to be studied and discussed a lot more. So I think that the issue of trust is one factor that's fueling political brinkmanship. Another factor is this cohesion issue. And cohesion, again, is one of those words that um, economists never used to look at very much, something that anthropologists and sociologists look at a lot. And it's very, very relevant now in terms of how the political economy is playing out. It's something I started to look at myself, um, really first back in the late 1990s, when I was working in Japan running the Tokyo Bureau for the Financial Times during the Japanese financial crisis. And I was very struck one day because I went to see the head of a large Japanese bank who told me that things were tough, there was a crisis going on in Japan, he was going to have to cut his wage bill by 20%. So he said, of course, I will have to cut everyone's salary by 20% and my salary by 30%. And I went, of course. <laughs> and he looked at me and went, well, you come from England. And in England, you would, of course, cut your workforce by 20%. And there was a pause and he went, and in America, you'd cut the workforce by 40% and pay me 20% more. <laughs> <laughs> but there's quite an important point about this, which is that one of the things that's very notable about Japan, and those of you who are Japanese may wish to correct me or not, but one of the things that I found very admirable as a guy living in Japan 
was this very high sense of social cohesion, this very high sense of shared gain and shared pain. And this idea that if there were sacrifices to be made, they should be spread out, if not entirely equally, at least in a way that ensured that people continued to buy into the system as a whole. You can see that in many, many spheres of Japanese life, ranging from the bond market, where my personal theory is that Japanese pension funds will keep buying Japanese government bonds even if the country is downgraded to triple E, because if everyone has a haircut, if they have a haircut together, then it's kind of part of the shared experience. Through to what happened in the banking crisis, through to what happened with the tragedy of the earthquake, time and again there's a sense of sharing pain. In many ways, I think it comes out of an equally strong sense in Japan of having a, a constraint to resources. I mean, the Japanese were often telling me when I worked there that Japan's a small island nation with very few resources, very little land. And this sense of resource constraint, the sense that actually you don't have finite abundance of land, resources, or anything, the pie is fixed and needs to be divided up is a common theme throughout Japanese culture. And it's one factor why people are so aware of the sense of how to divide up a pie. Moving to a country like America, I was struck almost from day one by the very, very sharp contrast in terms of attitude towards resources and resource constraint and that so-called pie. I mean, America was founded by a group of pioneers who arrived in America believing that the sky was the limit. If you ran out of eat land in the east, young man, you just kind of went west and kept going. There was always more. You could always grow the pie. You could always make it bigger. And you could always grow the economy, either through acquisition or land grabs or through entrepreneurship or through immigration or through innovation. And these days, it's innovation is the magic wand that everyone's looking to. But throughout American cultural history, this idea of being able to grow the pie is very deeply interwoven into popular culture and the political debate. And it crops up over and over again, even today. I mean, it would be very, very hard to imagine an American politician standing up today and saying, you know what, guys, in the next few years, the economy's not going to grow. Or if it does, it's just going to grow a little bit. It would be almost taboo within America today to admit that permanent growth is not a sensible goal, or to even admit the resources might be constrained. And within that context, it's very hard in America today to have a discussion about how to divide up a pie that's fixed, or how to allocate pain, because much of the political debate still hasn't really acknowledged that there is pain to be allocated at all. Much of the political debate will not really accept that the pie may not keep growing permanently. And there aren't that many cultural mechanisms to even discuss these issues within the American context. It's one of the reasons why so much of the debate within America seems to be going past each other and often has a sli slightly nonsensical um, aspect to the whole thing. So within that context, if you look at that cultural pattern, understanding the gridlock is not that hard. Because for the most part, the real issues the real tensions, the real challenges simply have not been discussed. The Eurozone, of course, <coughs> has a very different context. Um, there you have the issue of cohesion playing out on two different levels. You have the entirely unresolved issue of cohesion between nations, which for the most part is an area of great ambiguity, great ambivalence. You also have the question of cohesion between the elites and the population. And one of the tragedies of the Eurozone is that a project that was designed to heal the wounds of World War II is now risking reopening them in many areas in terms of creating, stoking up tensions between different nations. And at the same time, a project that was supposed to be taking forward a democratic agenda is actually exposing some of the democratic conceit in the sense that the Eurozone project was devised by a rather shadowy group of Eurozone elites without necessarily as much popular buy-in as they like to think they had at the time. And as the tensions get harder, as the conflicts get more visible, in many ways that conceit is being exposed. And so once again, the idea of having an honest, upfront discussion, not never mind amongst the elites, but amongst the population as a whole of the Eurozone, 
about how to deal with the pie that is currently fixed and where pain it needs to be allocated, that is extremely hard. And so, on top of the culture of consensus, on top of the problems of a bureaucratic machinery that is very, very hidebound, you have these unresolved issues about how to share, about how to create cohesion and trust that are fueling into this fundamental sense of gridlock or political brinkmanship. Now, if you want to be optimistic, the good news is that notwithstanding the fact that we've entered this new era of brinkmanship where politics and state matter so much, in some ways, the economy as a whole, the underlying economy, has not actually fallen off a cliff. If you're being a hardcore economist these days who says, pa, social science, pa, psychology, anthropology, I don't want to look at that, you can point to the fact that actually in the US you still have a modicum of growth, not strong growth, it's slowing down, but you have some growth. And the Eurozone has just recently entered recession, but at least it's thus far a relatively mild recession. And again, if you want to be optimistic and try and make sense of this world without feeling too dazed and confused, your other point of hope or optimism is to say that notwithstanding these dysfunctional politics, the markets at least don't appear to be overreacting. On the contrary, something quite striking has happened in the markets in the last year, which is that in many ways the markets have become not so much dazed as almost completely numb. If you think back a decade ago and imagine picking up a newspaper that had a headline like Greece may exit the euro or far-right party, you know, come second in poll or America, you know, on edge of default, you know, you might have panicked. You know, certainly if you go back to the era of great moderation when the world appeared to be pretty stable, many of the things that have happened in the last year would have caused people to absolutely run for the hills. Instead, as I said earlier, many of the key dials on the dashboard showing that the confidence or the sentiment in the markets have actually been calming down quite a bit recently. And to my mind, that's not so much because people think that the outlook is fantastically sunny. It's more because they have come a bit like that character in Alice in Wonderland to simply believe or at least accept six impossible things before breakfast. Everyone's had so much practice at extraordinary things happening, at coping with gridlock, coping with brinkmanship, coping with these cycles of crisis, drama, resolution over and over again, going to the edge of the cliff, maybe engaging in a bit of bungee jumping and then coming back up again that markets have kind of got used to it. So if you want to be optimistic, you could just say, well, we have this world of, world of dysfunctional politics, so be it. The economy has not fallen off a cliff, and for the most part, markets have not either. If you want to be pessimistic, though, you can point out at least four ways that this new climate is deeply debilitating. Firstly, but not least, um, markets have a nasty habit of not reacting to anything for a very long time and suddenly, then suddenly reacting far too much. The fact that people have become so dazed or so complacent about the constant threat of default drama disaster on both sides of the Atlantic doesn't mean that one day they might not suddenly crack and lose confidence and you could have the beginnings of a very nasty spiral. The second area of concern is the fact that this climate of brinkmanship, this climate of perpetual political jostling, is very negative for businesses. If you look at what companies are doing these days in terms of investment and try to understand why the economy is so sluggish on both sides of the Atlantic, a large part of it is because businesses are part of the group of people who have been losing faith. Um, I was very struck about six months ago because I took part in a round table of CEOs, American CEOs, in Washington. It's a kind of self-help group for CEOs who get together (laughs) twice a year to kind of talk about their problems. And they did a big survey of 70 CEOs and asked these CEOs to rank 
which group they thought had done best um, over the previous year in terms of managing the economic crisis. Top of the list, the CEOs put themselves. <laughs> All of you aspiring CEOs will know that CEOs don't get paid for modesty. So they put 90% of them thought that big global companies had done well, and 80% of them thought that central banks had done well. In third place, way, way, way ahead of the US Congress, which was way down bottom along with the Eurozone governments, um, but in third place, ahead of the IMF, was the Chinese government. And the fact that American CEOs think that the Chinese government has done better in terms of creating a predictable, stable business climate is very indicative of a mindset that still permeates much of American business when I go and talk to them. It's very much acting as a drag in terms of investment and growth. Thirdly, a climate of political brinkmanship is not good for consumers or voters. Very obvious point, and I won't labour it, but if people have no idea what the government is going to do next, if people are nervous or downright cynical, if they've lost faith, not just in government, but the ability of government to produce a better future, that is not the kind of climate where they're going to go out and spend money and engage in lots of consumption or even build for the future. Again, if you look at the survey data in America today in particular, it's very revealing in terms of the level of pessimism or unease that's setting in about the future. And lastly, if you look at a world of political brinkmanship in the West, you're also looking at a global economy that is increasingly unmoored in the sense of not having a single pole around which the rest of the economy can essentially revolve or gravitate and a world where essentially there isn't one single source of leadership or direction or decision making. Ian Bremer, um, a friend of mine who's a political anal analyst, sometimes says that we've moved from a world in recent years where the G7 used to dominate before 2007, back in the era of great moderation, to a world where during the crisis it looked as if we had a G20 coming to the fore. The West woke up and realized that the emerging markets mattered enormously and they had to have a seat at the table. Somewhat belatedly, you might argue, but at least they realized it. So for a period, it looked as if we'd gone from the G7 to the G20. The problem today is that emerging market countries like China have the money today, but they appear to neither have the desire nor the ability to provide an alternative source of leadership on the global stage. And yet the West can't provide that leadership very effectively either because of the problem of political brinkmanship and gridlock and the lack of faith and credibility. So a world that was a G7 and flirted with the G20 has now effectively turned into the G0, where nobody is in charge, where drift, muddle through, and brinkmanship on the global platform has very much become the order of the day. The type of brinkmanship we're seeing inside individual countries is being played out on a much wider scale. So, as I say, three eras of history. Era of great moderation, the age of turbulence, and today the age of politics, political brinkmanship, political bargaining. One good thing is that this at least shows why courses like this matter. <laughs> Um, the days when you could hope to predict the future by simply plugging numbers into a spreadsheet are well and truly over. The kind of holistic um, approach that certainly Craig and Jonathan are championing is very, very valuable, not just inside the classroom, but in the real world too. And for that part, at least, you can see a silver lining in the current cloud. The second silver lining I'd leave you with really occurred to me today as I was trying to write a review about Nassim Nicholas Taleb's latest book. Um, is it, this is his follow-up to The Black Swan. Although being Taleb, he says it is not a follow-up, it's actually The Black Swan was merely a, a prequel to his big work, which I'm actually going to show you all because I hope he repays a favor when I do my book. But um, it's called Anti-Fragile. And what he argues in his book is that it's time we basically all grew up and realized that life is never predictable. 
This sunny confidence that ruled pre-2007 that we could predict the future always was an illusion, and actually a very, very dangerous illusion, because the reality is that life is unpredictable. Random shocks, those black swans occur pretty regularly, and the only way to cope with them is not to sit there and keep fine-tuning your models with better and better inputs, but to recognize that you just need to roll with the punches. It sounds like a rather um, packed piece of pub philosophy. I think it's probably true, and it has a lot of impact for how things are created and devised and run on every level, from central bankers, I mean, Mervyn King has recently quoted Tulip in relation to monetary policy, through to how companies run, their, run themselves, how we all plan for our own careers. And so I'll just leave you with the last thought, which is that in an era of political brinkmanship, at least we know we're juggling many balls. At least we know that we have to try and understand life on many different levels to make sense of it. And at least we know there is no single answer. This era of muddle through is going to last a very long time, probably, I would suspect, during much of our careers. And so I just urge you all the best of luck in making the best of it drawing on many different disciplines and say a very big thank you for listening to me. Joanne, you're willing to take a few questions. Yep, if we haven't all gone from uh, Led Zeppelin's Dazed and Confused to Pink Floyd's Comfortably Numb in response. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to go ahead and call on people? No, I'm very happy to take any questions on any of that. Um, or I realize I never explained why I thought Ireland had a high level of faith in government, but um, that or anthropology or the media or anything else. So um, one there, then one back there. Um, thank you very much. I'm also a lowly journalist, um, and I work for a Japanese news agency, Digi Press, so thank you very much for that. Um, one thing I was interested in was your um, thing of perspective, because until very recently I was one of those unemployed uh, graduates, and you know, went to the job centre, grew up very quickly, and um, I kind of had this rational fear I'll never get a job. But then my parents are Czech, and my dad said, you know, look, you know, um, I got a prison sentence of three and a half years in Czechoslovakia, I came here, I spoke no English. Uh, my granny, you know, she grew up in non occupied Czechoslovakia during World War II. And he said that for whatever your difficulties, remember that you do have quite a lot. And, um, you know, just have that kind of historical perspective. And, and I was going through a very tough time, but I think you know, he had a point. And would you maybe say that, that life does go up and down and maybe, you know, okay, okay like we do have these problems and it's, life isn't obviously ideal and things could get a lot worse, but... You know, the Soviet Union did collapse. My parents never thought it would. They could eventually go back. Um, and, uh, yeah. Well, I, I actually I think you may raise a very interesting point, which is that I did my field work as an anthropologist in um, the Soviet Republic of Tajikistan. And in the two years I was there doing field work on the ground, it was the, still the Soviet Union. And I thought I was studying a system that was pretty permanent. Um, and then, of course... Within a year of me finishing my field work, what had been anthropology effectively turned into history, and <laughs> which is kind of funny now, but it wasn't at the time because that was my. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, without meaning to get, you know, there was actually a very tragic undertone, which was a system and a society that I thought was very stable imploded very brutally and very, very, very violently, um, and that shattered my faith at a stroke in the permanence of almost anything. And what really struck me when I came back to the West was the degree to which most people from my generation appeared to be living their life like they were in a warm, cozy bath. And there was a really, really big intergenerational gap, which people very rarely spoke about. You know, if you spoke to people who were, you know, had lived through World War II or come from Eastern Europe, you know, yes, you'd hear about rationing. What you didn't hear about was this idea that life actually is not as stable and as predictable as many people in the 70s, 80s, and 90s were brought up to believe. And I do think, I mean, again, to give Taleb another plug, and I hope he repays a compliment one day, 
Um, <clears throat> you know, I do think this is a key point he raises in his book, that actually we just all have to grow up and roll with the punches. And in many ways, the era of great moderation was the aberration, not the norm. And it doesn't mean that life is going to be easy, but it does mean that actually instability is something which, um, although it can be painful to live with, doesn't need to be the end of everything. I mean, many of you, if you want to get geeky, those of you who are doing economics um, as an undergraduate, which is obviously a wonderful degree, um, go back and look at Mervyn King's speech um, about 20 years on monetary policy that he gave last month, in which he actually quotes um, Taleb's um, concept of anti-fragile. And, you know, Mervyn, Mervyn, you know, obviously, who's homegrown out of the LSE, makes a very fundamental point that, you know, the role of monetary policy is not to predict with perfect confidence what's going to happen next. Never mind all those flashy charts you get at the back of, back of the Bank of England's Financial Stability Review. It really is to recognize the limits of prediction and to try to roll with the punches and to show some humility. And if the era of political brinkmanship is going to be an era of humility, then that's quite a good thing. Now, the question back there. Um, good evening, Gillian. Uh, my name is William Wong, and I was the visiting fellow here a couple of years ago. Now, as a polymath myself, I can't wait to see your silo-busting book, if you want to read it. But more seriously, earlier you mentioned, or you just touched upon, um, the, the shift around 2007. Previously, people used to look up to their political business leaders as, as uh, role models. And now we look at people like ourselves. Now, I, I always remember on the night of the U.S. election, I was staying up to about 3 a.m. and whilst watching CNN and BBC, I was a look, also looking at my Twitter timeline, and I noticed virtually everyone I followed was all pro-Obama, and I thought there's something not quite right about it. So I posted a tweet saying, "Well, how come no one is talking anything about Mitt Romney? Not that I was going to vote for him or anything." And a friend of mine picked it up. He says, "Uh oh." Beware of your self-selecting groupthink. Yeah. Yes. And this really kind of a hard moment for me. So it's all very well for us to kind of look upon our Twitter friends and, and Facebook, all that. It's really inherently dangerous to get groupthink. And also, I think, also this moral self-righteousness, which you can be part of a cocoon. Yeah, I wasn't saying that a move from a vertical axis of trust to horizontal was, you know, altogether a good thing. Um, you know, there are some good things about trusting your Facebook friends. Um, there are also some very bad things. And the issue of social fragmentation and intellectual echo chambers is something that I am absolutely fascinated by. And it's certainly a key aspect I'm looking at in my book. I mean, I'm glad you can't wait to see it. My editor, my editor feels he can't wait to see it either, since I haven't actually written very much. <laughs> I have a deadline hanging over me, which is rather, you know, terrifying. Um, but on a serious note, I mean, I am fascinated by this because I spent quite a lot of time with Twitter recently. Um, how many of you in the audience tweet? Okay. How many of you actually read t tweets and stuff as opposed to tweeting yourself? Okay. It's incredibly interesting what's happened with Twitter in the last few years. Um, when Biz Stone, one of the co-founders of Twitter, created Twitter, and it's only six, seven years ago, unbelievably, um, he conceived of it as basically being like a cyber pub. I mean, this, the origins of how he got the idea were literally in a bar, and he wanted to get everyone to congregate together from one bar to, to another bar. And the only way he could do that was with text messaging. And so he got into this idea of creating a forum that allowed everyone to congregate together quickly, to collide with each other quickly, to flock and in fact, flocking was a key image, you know, like birds flocking, of Twitter in the early days. That was a vision. And when Biz gives talks about Twitter, he has these birds flocking across the, scre the screens the whole time, which is one reason why the idea of Twitter came up. So the idea was you flocked together as a crowd. Now, what's actually happened to Twitter in the last two or three years is absolutely fascinating. Um, and it does cut to the core of what I'm looking at in that as the volume of tweets has exploded, 
I mean, absolutely exploded on a stunning scale. The metrics will blow your mind. There are now so many tweets floating around. There's such a big hose pipe, which is a jargon that they have in San Francisco, that it's become increasingly in utterly impossible for anybody to regard Twitter anymore as a single flocking collision place. It's not a pub. It's thousands and thousands of different bars. And those thousands of bars are the hashtags. And basically, there's now so much in that post pipe that you have to start fragmenting those hash pipes, hashtags to a greater and greater degree. And what's happened now is Dick Costolo, who's the um, new CEO of Twitter, himself, who runs the darn place, has no idea what's in those hashtags because there are so many of them. And so a tool that started off very much as a mechanism to try and enable people to collide with each other has now become a tool that's effectively fragmenting people intellectually. Not by any fiat, because actually any of us can go onto any hashtag on Twitter. You know, the theory is it's the ultimate democratic tool because we can all eavesdrop on everyone else's conversations. But in reality, we're becoming increasingly self-selecting. And if you look at the way that social media is increasingly channeling people's access to news via social networks, essentially through bespoke, customized information that's customized by the person concerned and their social network. If you look at how the patterns of communication are developing in terms of who you talk to and then try and map that onto social and political groups, what you're seeing is that the promise of technology, which could be a tool to unite us and break down silos, is actually often fragmenting us as much as, as it's uniting us. And so the thing that I'm passionate about, and I won't talk about it too much because I could talk for another hour and you'll get very bored, but the great paradox of 21st century life today is that we live in a system that's more integrated as a single system than ever before in history in the sense that shots can transmit their way through the system or be transmitted at lightning speed. And what happens in one corner can blow up the rest of the system very, very fast. So we're interconnected as a system and yet we're increasingly fragmented socially, politically, through technical, technological elites or the geeks in their silos. And the net result is that we're interconnected, but interconnected in ways that we are increasingly finding it tough to understand because we're so fragmented socially and cognitively as well. Anyway, that's roughly my book. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there. Go on that side. One of the themes of your talk is the um, collapse of faith um, in almost all our institutions in public life and the leaders of those institutions. And it seems to me that part of that collapse in faith is due to the collapse in the morality and integrity of those institutions and the people that run them. And I think part of that collapse is due to the cult of the individual that so dominates our society today, the me, me, me society. Now, there is a view that if Western society in particular is going to heal itself somehow or the other, either both economically, financially and socially, there's got to be a restoration of morality and integrity in public life. And who is there around that is actually going to be able to do that in today's society? Um, yeah. It's certainly not going to be one direction, is it? Um, I'm trying to think of my daughters and what they look up to. Um, um, oh, the, sorry, one direction are obviously fabulous too. Uh, um, I mean, how is faith going to get restored? Um, I think it's going to be tough to build the type of credibility of institutions or rebuild the credibility of institutions in the way that they existed um, in early decades, partly because there has been so much cultural change and partly because there is now the illusion of equal access and instant communication and a sort of culture of instant gratification um, which cannot be matched by the structures we have today. I mean, the honest answer is I don't, I don't know where the sources of you know, morality and common 
belief are going to come from. Um, I do, however, have great capacity or great, great faith in the capacity of human beings to reinvent themselves. And, you know, whether it's looking at the number of pe young people today who volunteer or do activism or, you know, get engaged, you know, I have a lot of faith. I mean, standing in a university environment, which I'd like to believe that most of the students here are not all just me, 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 but have a wider vision. Um, it just might not be quite the same vision that existed in the post-war years. Hi, I'm Corey, and I'm a student here. I have a related follow-up question. So the two ideas, the idea of credit and cohesion, we generally associate with individuals. So trust between individuals or cohesion on an individual level, which may, on an incremental level, expand to a social level, but fundamentally, it begins with individuals. The contrast to that is a lot of the post-crisis reform we've seen, whether it's been Dodd-Frank in the US or Basel III, has actually started on the institutional level. And even this past summer, with the library scandal here in the UK as well, a lot of the initial ways of resolving that pertains to institutions and the potential prosecutions were there to follow. And so my question is, is this tension between the individual sources of the problem, which you're discussing, and the institutional solutions real, or how can we think about bridging that in terms of moving forward? Well, in terms of life post-2007, you know, you have two things going on. You have a general political backlash with some moralistic overtones against the vague idea of greedy bankers. Um, so you have social norms changing to a degree, and you can argue whether that's fair or not. Um, for my part, I think that many people, many groups, uh, many institutions and many groups of actors in society contributed to the financial crisis. Um, you know, that includes rating agencies, politicians, consumers, journalists. Um, but bankers were the only ones of that group who got really rich and then carried on being rich, which explains so much of the public anger. Um, but you've had a moralistic backlash against sort of individual values. Um, but you've also had reforms that are in aimed at trying to change the institutional underpinning or the structural underpinning of the financial markets. Um, but unfortunately, you're doing so in a fantastically complex, often very messy way. And although there have been some victories or some, you know, some progress on the part of the reformers, it's been a very, very messy process that hasn't gone nearly as far as anyone <coughs> wanted to see. And in some cases, it has actually made the problem worse, not better. Um, so it's a, it's a messy, messy picture. I mean, I think that you know, if you want to be optimistic, um, you can go back to the 1930s and see what happened after the 1929 crash. When, interestingly enough, um, the ratio of banking salaries to non-banking salaries for professional um, people, employees, in 1929 was almost exactly the same as in, 19, as in 2007. Between 1900 and 1929, it climbed very rapidly from 1 to 1 to 1. 1 to 7 times. And again, between about 1979 and 2007, it also rose very rapidly. So you had a very similar dramatic upswing that mirrored the expansion of finance within the economy as a whole, again, between the 1920s and 19, um, 1990s and, and the noughties. What happened after 1929, though, is very interesting because it took about four to five years before salaries or relative salaries started to come back down again. And it really wasn't until the 1940s that essentially banking salaries, relative to non-banking salaries, crashed back to their 1900 level. And they stayed down there for about two decades in the post four years. And that went hand in hand with quite a radical change in attitudes towards finance in society more broadly. I mean, those of you who are old enough to remember it will know that you know, in the 1960s, you know, being a manufacturing CEO was probably as well paid as being a bank CEO and probably had the same stat status. I mean, doctors were not paid a lot less than bankers in the post war years. So there was a shift in attitudes that, that, that then, of course, got reversed in the 1980s onwards. It's not impossible to imagine that a similar shift could happen again. I mean, it's harder, but of course, remember that you know, we in 2012, relative to 2008, are already sitting in 1933. You have to go back and look at what happened in 1946, relative to 1929, to try and imagine what the future might look like in 
a decade or two's time. Of course, the 1940s had the war, and that changed things a lot. But I'd say never say never. And if any of you want to find the data to back that up, um, there's a fantastic um, piece of research done by Philippon and Reshev. Again, you can Google it very easily, which compares what's happening today with what happened back in the 1920s and 30s. Um, I think for balance, yeah, over there. And Hi, my name is Andreas. I'm studying international relations here. And I was very interested in your views on sharing the pie and how that um, uh, cultural baggage um, influences decision-making. I was wondering whether you think um, that um, the American unfamiliarity with sharing the pain uh, also is transferable to the uh, domain of environmental cooperation on an international level uh, on... Um, realizing that there might be a limit to that and uh, how you could um, contrast that with maybe Japanese um, bigger involvement in, in the cooperation process there. Thank you. Well, those of you who are um, Japanese will know that this concept of resources being finite you know, plays in very much to the environmental debate in some ways in Japan. Um, I mean, I was, again, I was very struck, again, on this issue of sharing, sharing pain and things was Part of you know, the amazing reaction of the Japanese population in places like Tokyo um, to the whole power cuts and the fact you know, that so many people are willing to endure you know, incredibly high temperatures, lack of air conditioning, etc., etc., um, in a way that you know, it would be kind of hard to imagine that playing out in America today. I mean, you know, I, I would love to think that if there was a huge power cuts today in America in the summer that everyone would willingly forego their air conditioning um, I find it quite hard to imagine that, though. Maybe I'm being a bit cynical. In terms of the environmental issue, I mean, again, if you're looking at resources, the question of whether people are willing to acknowledge resource constraint, um, you know, both inside countries and on a global basis, is critical. And you know, you can see where America is in terms of the whole um, carbon treaties and the debates about the environmental um, attempts, you know, climate change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's a very different type of perception and a very different tone to the political debate on different parts of the Atlantic. Maybe a last question. One more question. question. Yeah. Okay, the woman behind. So there. Um, good evening. I'm an economics undergraduate student here at LSE. In the early or parts of your lecture, you, you spoke about how crises are actually what make change, ha change happen. To what extent do you, do you think that the recent measures taken by the ECB to tame volatility in the markets and to reduce crises, for example, measures that have reduced um, bond yields for lots of the Eurozone countries, are actually preventing changes and preventing those necessary um, structural reforms that are necessary? I think that's a very good question because it really cuts the core of what I call this era of brinkmanship. Because I think what the ECB is engaged in right now is a kind of game of cliff dancing in that, you know, every three months the whole system slides off to the edge of the cliff and you get Greek yields, Spanish yields, Portuguese bond yields rising very sharply. And just when it looks like the whole system is going to spiral out of control and just when the FT is running crisis, crisis in its headlines, you know, the ECB has stepped in and pulled the system back from the brink. Um, but it doesn't pull it back too far because, you know, if they want to maintain the pressure on politicians to keep acting and for the entire system to can't keep moving slowly towards the direction of travel where the Eurozone leaders want it to go. And, you know, Spain is where that is now playing out most clearly and where essentially there's a game of chicken going on, which I would imagine will produce a new crisis fairly soon and then the whole system will pull back again. You know, it's, you can either be an optimist and say that underlying all the noise, there is a direction of travel. Slowly, messily, they are moving in the direction where most people think they probably ought to go if they're going to have a sustainable monetary union. You can have an argument about whether you want a monetary union or not, but that's kind of, kind of the direction they should go. Um, however, as, as systems go, it's very, very, very messy. And... It's debilitating for all the reasons I just outlined in terms of confidence and leadership and um, growth, or rather the lack of it. Okay. Let's thank Julian again.